welcome back to the Psychological Disorders chapter. In this section of the chapter, we're going to be covering the history of psychological disorders and their current definition. In fact, that discussion is going to take half of the amount of time that we're going to be spending on this chapter because understanding the history and the current formation of a definition for psychological disorders really requires a, an extensive discussion of past events. At first, we're going to start taking a look at the history of psychological disorders, and then we'll be discussing some of the more recent developments in detail. With no knowledge of the brain, our ancestors blamed external, supernatural forces for madness. Dark forces which entered the mind and drove the unfortunate victim insane. The most ancient way of getting them out was also mankind's first surgical procedure. Tray panning was performed by many cultures who believed that all a polluted mind really needed was a little fresh air. Screaming devils inside the head were released by simply boring a hole in it. The ancient Romans blamed the heavens for their mental troubles. The word lunatic comes from luna, the Latin word for moon. The Romans knew a lot about lunatics because there was usually one in charge. Of all the mad Roman emperors, and there were plenty, Caligula stood out. He started off fairly mildly by making his horse a senator, but it was all downhill from there. During his reign, he showed a flair for madness, cruelty, and megalomania seldom matched in history. It's now suspected schizophrenia was responsible for much of his extreme behavior, and only his godlike status protected him from the usual fate of the mentally ill. The devils of madness were whipped, stomped, or burnt out. Oh, for the patient's own good, of course. Religious fervor reached its peak between 1500 and 1700, when thousands of mad people were burnt as witches and deviants. By the 16th century, the spilling of blood was a little more methodical. By then, it was believed that all disease was carried in the body's vital fluids. Medicinal bleeding was a popular treatment popular with doctors anyway. Physicians either tapped the veins themselves or enlisted the help of friendly leeches. If leeches weren't available or didn't like the look of a prospective meal, a kind of artificial leech was applied to suck blood out, a practice known as cupping. Although over two and a half thousand years old, cupping is still practiced in the health spas of Finland. Other methods of purging were even stranger. O'Halloran's well, swing was designed in Europe by an Irishman. It was brought to the United States. Basically, what we do is strap somebody into the chair and spin them around. This dates back to the days when they thought that most illness, including mental illness, was blood or fluid borne. And so by spinning the person using centrifugal force, you would get the, the impure blood away from the brain and out into the arms and the fingers. Uh, if they threw up while you were doing this, that was a form of, of purging the bad fluids out of them too. But the epitome of the art was the tranquilizing chair, which managed to combine all the other fiendish methods into a kind of one-stop shop for torturing the mentally ill. A patient would be strapped into it for as much as six months. They could bleed them, they could leech them, they could douse them with cold fluids, put their feet into ice packs and pour hot uh, fluids over their head. Just a variety of things, all with the idea of bringing them back to reality. Now, one of the big questions is, why would you do any of these things that you saw in the movie? In fact, they seem rather bizarre, and it doesn't even seem like the people of those other time periods had a concept of mental illness the way we do today. And in fact, that actually was the case. Uh, the concept of a mental illness really does not start to appear until somewhere around the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, it's, it does not start all at one point, uh, but it is a 
aspect of psychological development that is not really extending backwards in history very far. Uh, in fact, uh, in many cases, uh, what we would recognize today as a psychological disorder was simply seen as an, sort of an alternate reality that people oftentimes experienced. And of course, it depends upon the culture that you look at, uh, but we are going to focus primarily on uh, European culture as its um, historical precedence up to today in North America. Now, there's a variety of uh, time periods that we're going to be looking at. The first one is going to be as far back as we can go uh, in Europe up to about 1800. And uh, 1800 is going to be the split uh, from, uh, from this time period to the next, largely because of some theoretical developments that occur that we'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, for now, though, uh, when you look backwards into uh, prehistory, um, early history of uh, Europe, what you wind up seeing is a mixture of things like astronomy uh, being mixed with astrology, so the, the movement of the stars and the existence of planets and uh, the theoretical interpretation that the presence of these light dots up in the sky are in some way going to be related to your personality characteristics or other patterns of behavior that you exhibit. Uh, very commonly, uh, you're going to see a connection between supernatural uh, issues that are most often connected to the Catholic Church. Um, devils, demons, and so forth are going to be oftentimes identified as responsible for causing a person to behave in a way that we would say is mentally ill today, but in the past, uh, people were not identifying as mental illness, but rather as a spirit possession. And also, uh, going along with the whole spirit possession business is a broader concept called moral capacity, uh, which essentially was the idea similar to what we saw in the previous chapter regarding trait theory or early trait theory. The idea that you have genes that allow you to uh, control yourself X amount and beyond that point, temptations beyond that point, uh, simply cannot be resisted by you. Now, no one's talking about genes specifically, but there is an idea that moral capacity is a skill that reaches one maximum level and any kind of temptation for um, immorality that exceeds that point will wind up uh, having the person fall into largely because they simply don't have a uh, sufficient moral capacity to be able to control themselves. And as we look at these examples on the slide here, we'll bring back these concepts to see how they actually applied. Now, um, let's suppose, for example, we go back to around 1400, 1500, and um, what we'll do is uh, we'll theoretically say a person with paranoid schizophrenia who has hallucinations and delusional thinking um, exists at that time period. So suppose that this individual claims that while they were out in the forest hunting or gathering, that uh, they saw Satan come out of the ground and tell them to go back into the village and kill a baby. Now, if this person actually comes back into the village and tells the other villagers uh, about their experience, people won't say, oh my God, this guy's just nuts. You know, that, that's the kind of thing that would happen today. Uh, but back then, 1400, 1500, if somebody came back and said, I saw Satan out in the woods, everybody would say, oh my God, he saw Satan out in the woods. And Satan told him to come back and kill our babies. So people would become upset by this. And uh, of course, one of the first people they're going to wind up uh, addressing the concern with is going to be the religious leader in the, um, in the village. And uh, in this case, the most likely treatment uh, for this problem, you know, the way to address the issue is to conduct an exorcism. And so that's going to be a religious treatment. Now, exorcisms, of course, take place in different ways. And we are focused primarily on Catholic Europe back in the uh, you know, 1400s, 1500s or so. Uh, but 
The same sort of story generally holds true in many other places as you go around the globe. So even though we're talking about Europe, this general process tends to uh, play itself out around the globe. Almost always you see kind of a religious approach to treating these aspects of what we would consider today simply be uh, hallucinations. Now, of course, uh, if in our uh, thought experiment, we have a person who has schizophrenia, a religious exorcism is not going to be a treatment for it, right? If, if uh, exorcisms eliminated schizophrenia, then all psychiatrists would be applying exorcisms at psychiatric facilities. But of course, that's not the case. And so even if uh, there was some placebo effect in this case, uh, and the person felt better and it actually modified the amount of hallucinations and delusions that they experienced, which, by the way, is a possibility, um, then uh, everybody would walk away and say, look, the exorcism worked. You know, we know that the exorcism worked because this guy was seeing Satan out in the woods. We performed the exorcism and now he says he doesn't see Satan. So everything's fine. Uh, but of course, uh, in a scenario where we actually have a, an individual that hallucinates evil spirits, um, those hallucinations are eventually going to come back. And if the exorcisms are tried over and over and over again, and they don't seem to take hold and to become a permanent treatment for, uh, for this issue, uh, one of the alternatives is to beat the person to physically beat them. And in fact, what you're trying to do, and as you, you might notice this from your own language, you are going to beat the devil out of them or beat the hell out of them. In fact, that's exactly where these phrases beat the devil out of and beat the hell out of come from. They come from early treatments for mental illness in which people not having a concept of mental illness would expect that the person was actually possessed by an evil spirit. And they, they theorize that if they beat the person and that person was really uncomfortable from the beating, that the evil spirit would simply just float away, go somewhere else, because it didn't want to be inside of a person that was experiencing this pain. Now, I know that sounds rather ridiculous today, I mean, it's, a, it's an evil spirit. You're going to make up your own um, ideas of what kinds of experiences an evil spirit would have. Um, I don't know why necessarily you would think that evil spirits are going to be uncomfortable because the body they're possessing is uncomfortable. But uh, this is the way it played itself out. So beatings would take place. Uh, a bunch of people would get together and they would physically beat the person very possibly until they were unconscious. And try to imagine in a realistic sense, if a person who has schizophrenia and hallucinates seeing Satan is beaten until they're unconscious because they're reporting the idea that they're seeing Satan, how often do you think they'll talk about Satan after the beating? Right? Not very much. Because if they start talking about Satan again, they're going to wind up getting another beating. So it shuts the person up. It doesn't matter that they're mentally ill, right? They, they, they are going to learn that beatings come when you start to talk about Satan. So uh, when, you do the beat, when you do the beatings, they appear to work because the person stops reporting seeing Satan. Even though they may be hallucinating, they stop talking about it. But as time goes by, uh, the person will start talking about their hallucinations again. Uh, they are, in this hypothetical example, after all, actually mentally ill. Uh, the bruises and the, the damage from the beating will pass, and the person will start talking about uh, seeing evil spirits and so forth again. And then if the beatings, repeated beatings, don't stop the person from experiencing these evil spirits, one of the last opportunities to protect yourself and the person who sees Satan is to burn them at the stake. Now, why burn them at the stake? Well, in, if we use modern terminology, 
the person who sees Satan is essentially like a disease vector, right? They are the one infected person in a village. They're the weak link that if Satan could possess anybody in the village, but Satan specifically focuses on this one individual. That's probably because they have low moral capacity. And that's where the moral capacity business comes back from. The idea that one person continually sees these evil spirits or has these odd experiences is because of all the members in the village only that person has a low enough moral capacity so that Satan could actually possess them. For the rest of us in the village that don't see Satan, we congratulate ourselves on having higher moral capacity. So it, it even makes sense when you start thinking about the whole process here that the exorcism, or as you might imagine as well, trips to church are going to be part of this uh, treatment process when a person starts to report seeing Satan uh, because largely the idea that they have low moral capacity needs to be buttressed by more ex more exposure to church make them read the Bible well you know back at that time they might be illiterate so they're going to have to start listening to lectures from the village priest um, and that's going to be the the process where all this gets started with you know before you move on to the exorcisms and then onto the beatings and then when simply nothing you do seems to work you're going to have to get rid of the person's body okay and that's why you're going to burn them at the stake because that person as a result of their moral uh, their low moral capacity is constantly attracting satan and if that person attracts satan and they live in the village that means you are secondarily exposing your family members and your children and so forth to uh, to Satan. And so the only way to get Satan out of the village is to take the person and burn them at the stake. So there's no physical body left that can be possessed by uh, by Satan. And uh, and that really is the underlying logic behind why you would burn somebody at the stake. Now, this story will start to change sometime around the Protestant Reformation, uh, beginning around the early 1500s. And largely uh, the issue is, as Martin Luther starts the Protestant thinking for Christianity, one of the things that he changes because he's trying to adjust the Catholic Church into ways that he thinks is better, uh, he drops the idea that members of the church, like the priests, can judge individuals and decide whether or not they should be burned at the stake, that is murdered. And so for the Protestants, they take uh, burning at the stake off the table and they have a separate theoretical approach, right? And I say theoretical, uh, this is you know a different understanding of religion. The idea here is if you assume that God is all powerful and a person is also possessed by the devil, then God had to let that possession occur, which means that the person's possession by the devil is really a test for you to figure out how to fix the problem not an issue of concern because if God doesn't want your family members to be possessed by Satan, then God won't let your family members to be possessed by Satan. What you have to do is figure out how to treat or get rid of Satan in that one individual without killing them because God is all powerful and it is not up to you to make a decision about life or death for anybody. And so, Although you may go through the exorcisms, although you may go through the beatings, burning at the stake is now off the table. So we're gonna to have to move on to other treatments. Now, where do you get the treatments from? Well, they're gonna be conjured up by the medical doctors at the time. And as you saw in the video that we just watched, uh, one of the ideas about medical health back in the 14, 1500s, which actually extends back literally thousands of years and is at, uh, takes a, a similar form literally around the globe, 
is that medical health is very closely related to the proper balance of fluids in your body. So in Europe, there was a concept of having four humors and a humor is a fluid. So uh, by pre-scientific medical reasoning in Europe, there was an idea that there were four basic fluids in your body that had to be in balance. If they were in balance, then you had normal health. If they were out of balance or imbalanced, then you would wind up with medical problems or even potentially um, have these issues regarding um, devil possession. So one of the possibilities was to change the amount of fluid in the body. One of the ways in which you could do that was to castrate an individual. Of course, this would only apply for males, uh, but it was one of the uh, medical treatments uh, that would be applied. Now try to imagine uh, this is a time before anesthetics exist. A person is reporting that they're seeing evil spirits and you, you perform exorcisms repeatedly, you beat them repeatedly, um, you're not sure what else to do, and then the medical doctor in the village says, well, you know, based on my theorizing about the fluids in the body, maybe we should castrate them. Um, and so uh, with no anesthetic, uh, a bunch of people are going to have to hold this individual down and castrate them. Now try to imagine how much is this individual going to talk about seeing Satan out in the woods after they've had their testicles cut off? Not a whole lot, right? I think that's probably what you're guessing. And so the castrations will oftentimes seem to work, right? Because the person reports seeing Satan and then you castrate them and they don't talk about Satan anymore. Of course, it's very likely that the person continues to hallucinate. They just learned to shut up about it. But of course, if uh, eventually, uh, just like with the beatings, uh, they get around to talking about the hallucinations again, you may move on to another medical treatment. One of the other possibilities here is to drain their blood. And why would you drain their blood? Well, again, it gets back to the four humor or four fluid uh, theory of medical health. If the blood is bad, Okay, and again, here's another phrase in your language, bad blood. If a person has bad blood, then you need to get rid of it. Well, if their blood is bad, how do you get rid of it? Well, you literally cut them and let them bleed out. And as they bleed out, they will get rid of the bad blood. And then uh, when, the, when the wound heals, they will uh, develop new, clean, healthy blood and then they should be fine. So try to imagine what happens. You kind of saw this in the video. You take a person, you strap them into a chair, and then you slice them in their elbow so that they bleed out into a bucket. In fact, they make a bucket of blood, which is, again, another phrase in your language, bucket of blood. And you let this person bleed out and bleed and bleed, what, what do you suppose happens as you bleed and bleed and bleed, right? You start getting tired and sleepy and woozy. And of course, you get quiet. And when people, the medical doctors, would bleed people excessively, they noticed that these individuals would calm down. And as a result, they started to see the treatment of uh, draining uh, blood from an individual that was possessed as an effective treatment because they were not talking about their hallucinations anymore. Of course, for them, it's not necessarily a hallucination. It very well may be a real demon possession. Another possibility that showed up around 1600 was essentially an early form of a blood transfusion. Uh, once uh, once the, uh, the idea that you could possibly not just drain the blood, but replace the blood immediately with clean blood uh, was kind of uh, created, uh, you would do the same similar type of work. Cut, uh, put a person in a chair, strap them in, cut their elbow, and then take a 
metal funnel and shove the funnel into one of the exposed arteries. Now, you're going to pour blood into the funnel so it gets into the person. This is, this is the earliest version of a blood transfusion I've ever heard of. But where, you, where are you going to get clean blood from? Well, you're going to get clean blood from a farm animal, right? You may kill a sheep or a pig and pick it up and drain the blood from the animal into a bucket. Then you'll take that bucket and you'll pour the bucket of blood into the funnel so that it is this really crude version of a blood transfusion. Now, you don't have to be a nursing student to know that if you're taking animal blood and you're using it in a, tra in a transfusion with a human being, that the person's going to eventually die. And the more, more animal blood you put into the transfusion, the closer and closer the person gets to dying. But as they're dying, they are quieting down. And that's really what most of the medical doctors are actually focused on. The fact that the person is calming down. And so as they calm down through the process of dying as a result of being exposed to animal blood, the medical doctors are looking at that as a success because they're not seeing that the person is dying. What they see is that they are calming down. And that's what they're really focused on. So it's possible that the person will make it all the way to death, um, in which case you'll try to readjust which type of animal blood you used, whether it was a sheep or a goat or a pig or the amount of animal blood. Uh, but it's all just uh, wit and whimsy, guesswork on the part of the medical doctors. Uh, obviously, there's no double blind controlled study here. Uh, this is a lot of guesswork about what's actually going on. And it's these processes are not going to happen very often anyway. So um, you can't expect any real recipe uh, to show up to properly do this kind of work. If you uh, run through the medical treatments, castrate the individual, drain their blood, replace their blood. They're still alive and they're still talking about seeing Satan. And they are becoming dangerous. Um, then it's very possible that the person will be placed into a cage. Um, and that is um, in reports back in the 1500s of small villages in Europe. Uh, what oftentimes would happen is that if an individual that we would refer to as mentally ill today was in the village and also was in some way violent or dangerous to the other members of the village, all the members of the village would contribute some money to the, uh, to the blacksmith. The blacksmith would make a cage and then they would take the person, place them in the cage, lock it shut, and wait for the person to get better simply as a way to control them uh, you know so that the dangerous individual wasn't around your family members if you had to go out in the fields and farm who's protecting your children and your wife well if this person's running around and they're dangerous uh, you're going to have to address the issue and that's how this uh, this this is how this whole process would play itself out now here's a general question for you how long do you have to be in a iron cage before your schizophrenia goes away right and the answer there is of course infinity being placed in an iron cage is not a treatment for schizophrenia so once the person goes in a cage they literally will not come out and that's exactly what used to happen uh, once a person was caged and the and they were locked in there uh, they of course don't get better in fact probably being locked inside this cage probably agitated their symptoms and as a result uh, they would just stay in there until eventually they died of course they would be fed uh, you know along the way and in fact I even remember re reading one report how uh, cages like this were placed over makeshift bridges over top of streams so that kind of like if you had a a hamster floor to a, a hamster's cage is basically made out of bars and that way the animal's waste can fall through and they did the same thing with these uh, mentally ill individuals they would make a bridge over a stream 
the floor of the cage uh, that they were placed in, of course, was made out of bars. And so as they eliminated their waste, it would just fall into the stream and wash away. Uh, because prior to that, the person just lived in their own waste. And of course, this is hundreds of years before germ theory ever occurred. And so uh, these individuals, obviously, we know today, would wind up with uh, infections from uh, being exposed to their own waste, uh, whereas that you know, was not a concern for, uh, for people uh, so many hundreds of years ago. One other possibility, if you could not afford to make a cage, uh, could cause the blacksmith to simply create chains. And what the villagers would do is they would chain the person to a stone wall, very much in the way that you would see in cartoons and animations where a person's in a dungeon and they're shackled to the wall. The same process would take place here uh, because it would cost much less money to make chains. Um, and if you just made a few feet of chains, uh, the person could be shackled to a stone wall and then you could come by and feed them every day and that would be the end of the, the story. You know, you would just essentially wait for them to, uh, to pass away and um, there'd be nothing else to talk about. Now, these treatments obviously are extremely crude uh, relative to anything that you would see being done today. And of course, all of these things, why, we go, why I go through them in such detail is because they seem really rather bizarre. And of course, you know, as you listen to these stories, there's probably a lot of humor in how stupid people were uh, from the past. But of course, you know, that's a, a real strong degree of presentism, right? From being uh, alive today and looking back and knowing that uh, beatings and castration and bloodletting are all irrelevant practices regarding hallucinations. Uh, there is some context there that you should remember. Uh, remember, there's plenty of things that we can't treat well today. And uh, although they may not be connected to supernatural things, uh, they are certainly uh, problematic for us today. But in the future, uh, they're going to not be. So, for example, you know, as I make this lecture, we are on the COVID-19 lockdown. And it's reported fairly regularly that it'll take a year, year and a half to find a inoculation for this virus. Meanwhile, we sit here locked in uh, our houses, right? And uh, the economy is suffering. Uh, people are going to be exposed to the, uh, to the virus. Uh, some, uh, some number of people are going to wind up getting sick, possibly dying. Hop ahead, I don't know what, 100 years? Uh, people are, are going to be laughing at us for uh, how stupid we were, about how we didn't know enough about viruses, how we couldn't generate a, a vaccine or inoculation uh, rapidly enough. So, you know, when you laugh at individuals from 500 years ago, remember that people 100 years in the future are going to be laughing at us. There's lots of things we can't cure now. Cancer. Schizophrenia is still incurable. Um, COVID-19 and who knows what other virus or bacterial insult that comes along next. So it's good to put yourself in the broader context in this case. Now I mentioned we split the time period from prehistory up to 1800 uh, because there were some developments that occurred at about 1800. And uh, that's where we're going to start uh, going now with our history. At about 1800, the medical doctors in France were actually feeling pretty good about themselves. In fact, you have to look at this in terms of the history that I gave you way back in Chapter 1. Back in Chapter 1, we talked about how the field of physics got started in 1600. Now it's 200 years later. What has been happening in physics? Well, as physics has improved as a field of science, it has been applied into medicine to improve medical treatments. And it's been doing well. And by 1800, 
Medical doctors, because of the improvements that have largely come from anatomy as well as physics in general, are starting to feel pretty good about themselves. And they start to make these comments that at 1800, all of the treatments that they use should only be based upon medical causes. And they should never refer to religious treatments any longer. Because actually it was very common uh, back in the 1700s and before that, in which a medical doctor might treat someone by saying that they had a kidney disorder plus poor moral capacity. Uh, you know, they had alcoholism and a demon possession. So there was a mixture of kind of a, a biological uh, or worldly type of um, diagnosis mixed with a supernatural type of diagnosis. And that was fairly common to do. But because the medical doctors of the time at about 1800 are feeling pretty good about themselves that uh, that their field of medicine has advanced so much by 1800 that they think they should only focus on biology or other kinds of things that come out of scientific research, that that causes a break historically with how the mentally ill were treated versus how they get treated starting from around 1800. Keep in mind as well, this overarching idea of a medical model is really the beginning of medicine as you see it today. So if you have the flu and you go to Med Express or you're just general physician, if you break a leg, if you need an injection of some kind of medicine, most of that stuff really kind of starts off in about 1800 with this theorizing, uh, which takes place mostly in uh, France. Um, the medical model of medicine starts at 1800, but also so does the medical model of mental illness. And the medical model of mental illness is going to take a little bit more time to catch on overall. Um, so, you know, we're not going to have at the, at the time of 1800, a bunch of medical doctors in France make a declaration that all treatments for mental illness should be uh, carried out through only biological means. And then suddenly everybody around the globe be aware of that declaration or even to accept it. Um, it's going to take many decades before this approach actually spreads around and starts to affect the, uh, the medical community. And in fact, uh, one of the uh, ways in which you actually see this play itself out is in the story, A Christmas Carol. The story of Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol has a particular scene in which Ebenezer Scrooge first meets Jacob Marley. And when Scrooge meets Marley for the first time, Scrooge says, there may be more of gravy about you than of grave. And what Scrooge was actually saying was he was recognizing that he was seeing a ghost, but he wasn't certain that he wasn't hallucinating. And the hallucination he may have had may have come from gravy. That is, he may have had food poisoning, uh, a blot of mustard, an underdone potato, or some bad gravy that he had eaten was causing him to hallucinate. And so you actually start to see this medical model of mental illness kind of creeping into uh, Charles Dickens' story of A Christmas Carol because the idea that you could see something, hallucinate, and it actually have a physical cause was really the story of the medical model of mental illness. Now, w during this time, in the 1800s, which is the time frame we're really working in from 18 to about 1900, um, the treatment for the mentally ill almost exclusively will have a medical diagnosis. There is not much in the way of mental health diagnoses. 
And yes, you can find historically uh, people like Benjamin Rush and a variety of other people that are kind of working on uh, mental illness and early forms of psychiatry, uh, but it's not very widespread. Uh, most of the treatments for the mentally ill take place from a theoretical view of medicine entirely. And so the concept that uh, any mental illness is going to be directly related to a medical disorder is the primary way medical doctors are going to approach it. So uh, one of the uh, medical, medically theorized ideas uh, that occurred, I believe, back in the 1830s was that a person might hallucinate if their kidneys were not functioning properly. That is, so the idea that your kidneys are cleaning your blood is sort of there in the field of medicine. And if they are not cleaning your blood properly, then that may lead to contaminants in your blood, which would then cause you to hallucinate. This is, of course, not, uh, not really true uh, by today's standards. It was a theoretical approach back, uh, back, I believe, around the 1830s. Consequently, a, a surgical technique to remove one of your kidneys would ac actually take place in the hopes that uh, your blood would actually be cleaner afterward. Of course, removing a kidney is not a uh, appropriate treatment for uh, hallucinations. And so anybody who undergoes a kidney removal treatment uh, is still going to wind up with hallucinations. And, you know, any number of different surgical techniques like this uh, might take place. Uh, certainly drug treatments of the time, which are going to be based mostly off of herbal medicines. And uh, those during the 1800s are going to have virtually no, uh, no efficacy whatsoever. In fact, about the only medicine up until the 20th century that you'll actually see that will do anything regarding mental illness is going to be alcohol. And, you know, for people that hallucinate, uh, oftentimes will drink heavily to try to manage their hallucinations. And so oftentimes people who have hallucinations will wind up drinking excessively and essentially becoming alcoholics as a way to try to manage the symptoms that they have. Of course, alcohol doesn't do a very good job of it, and it more so uh, produces a uh, much larger secondary problem with alcoholism. Uh, but as you might imagine, uh, these issues uh, will really all be connected to each other and snowball into a much larger problem for the person with the mental illness. So let's take a look at this question. Approximately when did the medical model of mental illness develop? That should be an easy one, and of course the answer is C, 1800. That's just a thing uh, that you should be aware of. Remember, it's not just the medical model of mental illness, but it's also the medical model of medicine as well. When you go to the doctor today, everything that they're doing really comes from a historical standpoint that really kicks off at about 1800, because prior to 1800, Medical diagnoses were freely intermixed with religious diagnoses or aspects of morality uh, that were uh, not applied, that are not applied any longer. This finally gets us up to uh, 1900, and things take a substantial change now uh, at about 1900, and these are approximate dates. 1800 was an exact date. Medical doctors in 1800 in France actually met and had a conference. And so 1800 is the exact date for the development of that theoretical approach that everything should be based off of biology. 1900 is a somewhat loosey-goosey, give or take a decade kind of uh, uh, time frame. At about 1900, the idea that psychological disorders were actually partly related to your family upbringing actually starts to become a popular idea. And in fact, the idea comes from Sigmund Freud. Freud 
in his theories, as we covered in the previous chapter on personality, focused primarily on early childhood development and the fixation of psychic energies at one of the uh, psychosexual stages of development. These issues become popular during a time in which very few people are actually working on mental illness, largely because the basis of psychological functioning is really not known, right? So uh, a lot of, for anybody that works on psychological disorders, uh, it's just a lot of theorizing. Freud happens to become popular, and as a result, that's where we kind of wind up today. It's this treatment for uh, family upbringing and recognizing that developmental processes uh, are going to have an influence on later adult forms of mental illness. In fact, um, as Freud starts to write, and he does write prolifically during his 40 to 50 year career, these books that he writes are um, sold in bookstores. And if you happen to have sufficient education that you could read something by Freud, you might actually pick up one of these books and bring them home to try to diagnose yourself or a family member and to get an idea about how to treat these things. And in fact, um, Freud's writings largely become the basis for the beginning of the self-help movement, which of course even exists uh, clear up to today. So what we have is Freud making his psychosexual developments, uh, his uh, theorizing about dream interpretation, the edible complex, the other things that we've talked about in the, in the personality chapter, and selling these books at bookstores and having people just take those books home, read them over, and to try to diagnose themselves or a family member. During the 1900s, at least um, in the first half of the century from 1900 to 1950, you start seeing uh, psychological diagnoses become much more relevant. And again, the psychological diagnoses, though, are largely coming from Freud's diagnostic system. And that's going to be a very important point because when we get to 1950, uh, Freud will have passed away and the field of psychiatry, which he created, is going to abandon Freud entirely and a new diagnostic system will have to rise up. Um, and that's, uh, that's why we're going to have 1950 as the next break in the history of psychological disorders. But for the first 50 years of the 20th century, you still could get a medical diagnosis, but possibly also a psychological diagnosis. And the psychological diagnosis almost entirely was Freudian. You were going to be diagnosed with an oral fixation, an anal fixation, a Oedipal complex. Uh, you were going to have your uh, defense mechanisms identified in your psychological diagnosis. Everything about diagnoses are, are going to be, revolve around Freud's approach because it's so popular at that time. Depending upon whether or not you had a medical or psychological diagnosis meant you might get a medical or a psychiatric hospital stay. So there is going to be some indication that hormones influence people back in the early 20th century, uh, depending upon which decade you go into, you know, as you further go along, there's going to be more and more evidence for it. And in fact, uh, you might remember from chapter one that uh, the field of behavioral endocrinology, that is the, uh, the connection between psychology and hormones, is formally made in the 1940s. And so if there is a recognized hormonal imbalance in an individual, possibly secondary to a medical treatment or possibly as a result of a disease process, a medical stay will most likely occur at a standard hospital, whereas a psychiatric hospital stay will primarily take place because you had an edible complex or some particular type of uh, defense mechanism from a Freudian standpoint. This time period is also when uh, new biological treatments will start to appear. Uh, one of the most common at the time, uh, starting in the 1930s, was going to be a frontal lobotomy. 
Now, the frontal lobotomy was uh, created uh, from a medical doctor who theorized that portions of your ability to uh, control yourself or to uh, express hallucinations and delusional thinking would take place in the frontal lobes suggested that the wiring in the frontal lobes would be damaged naturally and that would be causing the mental illness so what you need to do is go in there and disrupt that circuitry so a frontal lobotomy would cause a, uh, a medical doctor to go in and literally cause slices across the frontal lobes and then to sew the person back up and to um, uh, you know see if the uh, the treatment worked what typically happened is in the way that they conducted the frontal lobotomies um, they influenced a lot of emotional behavior of the individuals so for example if we still stick with the example we had of the uh, theoretical paranoid schizophrenic uh, who's seeing Satan and maybe they're very agitated by their hallucinations uh, they're very worried and anxious and they yell a lot about seeing uh, evil spirits if you gave that person a frontal lobotomy they would calm down now note this is purely an emotional aspect their degree of emotionality reduces significantly and so the medical doctors in the 1930s incorrectly assumed that the calming effect of the frontal lobotomy was actually a successful treatment and so having performed the frontal lobotomy they send the person home and then they move on they would just do more frontal lobotomies this is before a time at which the medical community had a consistent pattern like they do today of using a treatment and then having a long-term follow-up to see whether or not there are any side effects because side effects could occur immediately or next week or next month or a year from now or you might wind up seeing side effects appear years in the future and that's something that the medical community recognizes today so you know if there's a new drug treatment that comes out for uh, depression that drug will be followed for decades um, to see how it winds up affecting people of different age ranges what happens if a person is on the drug for 30 years straight um, or if they're on it and off it on it and off it. there's all sorts of uh, events that occur uh, you know biologically things that you know they're kind of outside the realm of psychology that are purely uh, biochemical in nature and it's, it requires the medical community to follow these follow those things through but the medical community was not doing these things in the 1930s they gave you a treatment if it looked good they sent you home and that was it they they thought it looked good so they went ahead and they did it again with somebody else and so for about 20 years frontal lobotomies were being done by medical doctors and in fact the uh, they became very efficient at doing them the first frontal lobotomies required uh, you know opening up a person's uh, skull removing the skull bone damaging the frontal lobe and then putting the skull bone back on and sewing the person back up so they would have a fairly large scar on the forehead eventually the idea came that you could anesthetize a person pop out their eyeball and then use an ice pick and uh, what you would use is an ice pick and a hammer to chisel through the eye socket until you've reached the front portion of the brain and then basically just to wiggle the ice pick around a little bit to damage the front uh, the frontal lobe uh, then you could just pull out the ice pick pop the eye back in and send the person home with an eye patch um, and this process would take place over just 15 to 30 minutes um, and they became uh, practices that a psychiatrist would do in their office so you didn't even have to go to the hospital to be able to have it performed uh, you would arrange to have your frontal lobotomy uh, it would take a very short time and you would just leave immediately afterward another treatment uh, that you saw during this time uh, that also came into play was electroconvulsive shock therapy. Uh, 
Now, you might remember from chapter one, the very first instances of electroconvulsive shock therapy actually were taking place back in the 1790s um, by uh, Giovanni Aldini, uh, who was Galvani's nephew. Uh, and Giovanni Aldini would, uh, in using his uh, early version of a battery, electrocute his own head so significantly that he would pass out, but then he would report that his mood was better. And this treatment uh, really never caught on back at the, in the time in the 1790s or early 1800s. And as a result, it was largely kind of forgotten about. Uh, and nobody was really applying, uh, applying that treatment. What happens historically is that in the 1930s or so, a Hungarian medical doctor theorizes that mental illness may be caused because a person's brain is not functioning properly. And the way to get the brain to function properly is to reset it. Now, how would you reset a brain, right? Well, this, is, this follows the same reasoning for your laptop. If you're using your laptop and it freezes up or you get a blue screen, what you have to do is a reboot. Now that that should make sense, right? In a modern metaphor with a laptop, you just turn the, turn the laptop off, get a clean reboot, and then your laptop will work fine. That same metaphorical treatment was how this, uh, this medical doctor was talking about electroconvulsive shock therapy. That if a brain was not functioning properly, you can't literally turn a brain off and then reboot it, but what you can do is scramble the activity of the brain so significantly with electricity that the brain will have to reset itself afterward. And that is the theoretical approach to an electroconvulsive shock therapy session. And so a strong degree of electricity, a high voltage was used to throw a person into a seizure and after the seizure, um, the person, of course, uh, might be unconscious, but afterward, uh, they would report having a better mood state. Thankfully, over the course of decades, leading clear up to today, as the work is still being done, the medical community eventually picked up on evaluating the degree of voltage, whether or not there are alternate ways to conduct electroconvulsive shock therapy, and they have continually improved the process so that now uh, electroconvulsive shock therapy is a uh, very quiet, clean, sanitary process uh, that oftentimes takes place with the individual actually being unconscious. And, uh, and so it's not the horror treatment that you see literally in horror films today or probably the one standard uh, process that everybody talks about the 1960s or 1970s movie called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, where the uh, treatment for electroconvulsive shock therapy was overly dramatized as a horrible uh, seizure-inducing process where a person would you know, bite their own tongue off. Drug treatments uh, during the early 20th century really start to kick in. Uh, they are getting better uh, decade by decade, and one of the most significant advancements is going to be around the 1950s, uh, when uh, the development of Thorazine is applied to treat things like uh, schizophrenia. Uh, so uh, the presence of Thorazine will have a significant influence on um, drug treatment for really significant forms of psychological disorders, ones generally that, in which individuals have significant hallucinations and delusional thinking. And in fact, for all the people that are in psychiatric facilities, which are usually state-run, so that means they are funded by tax dollars. And of course, it's always difficult to raise more tax dollars because politicians have to ask to raise taxes. And if they do that, they wind up losing their job as a politician. In the end, you don't have enough psychiatric facilities. They're underfunded, 
and psychiatric facilities are actually uh, very poorly operated because they're consistently underfunded by the state. Um, and that's a story that, you know, is uh, very common with respect to anything that operates through tax dollars. Uh, but it was true back then. And once Thorazine had been discovered and it was used as a treatment for things like schizophrenia and other types of significant uh, psychological disorders, many of the individuals at these facilities were essentially given a, a bottle of pills and sent home. Uh, they were just left. And uh, what, you, what winds up happening, which is something you're actually going to see today, is as these individuals leave the psychiatric facilities, take their pills at home, they reduce a lot of the symptoms, but the Thorazine causes a lot of side effects. And in some cases, the side effects are so severe that the person, even when they're lucid, when they are taking their medication, make a conscious decision to instead have hallucinations and delusional thinking as opposed to dealing with the side effects of the Thorazine. And so they simply go off of the medication. But because they start hallucinating and are delusional, they, uh, they can't, of course, pay rent. They can't hold a job. They can't have uh, friendships. They wind up as homeless, mentally ill individuals. And that kind of leads to a process that you wind up seeing today. You know, when you, when you oftentimes hear about uh, the homeless population in the United States, what you generally don't hear is that most of the homeless have a significant mental health problem. And part of that mental health problem uh, conflicts between the field of psychology, politics, and uh, civil rights, and uh, the uh, psychological disorder that the individual has. We'll talk more about this as we go on. Uh, I don't want to get uh, too far afield, but uh, it leads to, at this time in the 1950s, begins leading to the kind of homeless uh, problem with uh, psychiatric patients that you wind up seeing today. One of the most significant aspects of uh, the early 20th century is the talk therapy process, which is, of course, very common today, where you have a psychological problem and you go to a therapist and start to talk about your life. Now, originally in the early 20th century, most of that work is going to be done from a Freudian standpoint, right? You may go and lay on a couch and get hypnotized and have your dreams analyzed and all these things that we know today have no significant bearing on the treatment of psychological disorders, but they were the most common ways in which things were done back then. And of course, uh, these ways, as we talked about back in the personality chapter, have become kind of the media version of how psychiatry and psychology operate today, uh, which is absolutely not true, uh, but they are just the characteristic way in which things are talked about. Now, let's consider this question. Electroconvulsive shock therapy was... The answer there is B, just one of many seizure-inducing therapies intended to reset the brain of the patient. We haven't talked about it, but there are a variety of drugs that will cause a person to have a seizure. And other than electroconvulsive shock therapy, there's insulin shock therapy, and there's also another substance called metrazole, which would cause a person to have seizures. And they were all just different ways to cause a person to have a seizure. And that was the original intention. If a person has a seizure, you are purposely scrambling the activity of the brain so that the brain would have to reset itself. And if it resets itself, the assumption was you might get a, some attenuation of the psychological symptoms that they had. And it turns out that that's actually true but to some degree. It's primarily true with respect to depression, which is the primary functional process for ECT today. It is primarily used to treat depression, although it can be used in a few other cases. It is mostly used for depression. Come the 1950s, what we wind up seeing is 
at this point, a real functional process that leads us up to today. Things have gotten better from the 1950s until today for absolutely certain. And in fact, I could say even generically, treatments and improvement and understanding of psychological disorders improves decade by decade. But the same general functional understanding of psychological disorders that really got started in the 1950s is the same one that we use today. And that is this, nature and nurture, or biology and environment are the basic underlying approach to all forms of psychological disorder. And in fact, that's part of the broader story of psychology throughout this entire semester. There are two very broad main sources of control for all aspects of behavior, whether it's mental illness or normal patterns of behavior. And that is biology and environment, nature and nurture. You have genes and other biological processes that are going to uh, contribute to uh, functional patterns of behavior. And there are also modifiable patterns of behavior or things that are easily modifiable. Uh, so they're going to be primarily related to nurture or the environment. So today um, for psychological disorders, we have medical and psychological diagnoses because it is clear that in some cases, psychological disorders are actually a direct result of a secondary process for some medical problem. For example, um, there are plenty of documented instances in which a person develops a brain tumor near their amygdala. And uh, hopefully you remember what the amygdala does. Uh, the amygdala is related to fear and aggression. So if a cancerous tumor grows and pushes on the amygdala, the individual from the physical pressing on the amygdala itself will simply cause more action potentials in that area, which leads to more fearful and more aggressive behavior. Consequently, individuals that have a, uh, just a, even a normal uh, average attitude emotionally with other people, right? They're just a calm, normal person you could talk to, slowly become angry over time. And eventually they may wind up in a, a criminal event like a, a road rage incident or they'll punch somebody in line at the supermarket because it's taken too long. Uh, that person gets arrested. And of course, the family members show up and they say, I, I can't understand what's actually happening here. Because they're arrested, a lawyer gets involved. The lawyer gets them uh, over to a, uh, a medical treatment. They get their brain scanned or the medical uh, uh, measures indicate for their blood uh, that they have cancer. And you follow up on it and you find out that there's a cancerous tumor pressing on their amygdala. When the tumor is eliminated, their personality goes right back to normal. Um, and these kinds of processes occur in a variety of different ways. Uh, this, these changes in personality occur largely as a result of the physical functioning of the brain secondary to some other medical problem. And of course, this can occur with any number of different uh, disorders from uh, imbalances in hormones, uh, like we talked about way back in chapter two. There was a list of psychiatric disorders that could occur from hormonal imbalances like overeating or anorexia, hypersexuality or hyposexuality, uh, aggression or timidness. Uh, they can all occur as a result of a, a secondary biological process. In most cases, um, psychiatric facility stays are going to wind up being the primary place where a, a person will be sent if they need to be hospitalized. Generally today, even if a purely medical problem causes a psychiatric disturbance, the best place for the person will be at a psychiatric facility because the psychiatric facility is a specialization for psychiatric problems. And as a result, they'll get better treatment there uh, as opposed to a generic hospital. Drug treatments get better. And in fact, this is one that uh, really requires a little bit of extra um, discussion. Drug treatments get better. Drug treatments are much more organized, much more specific by uh, pharmaceutical industry today. 
Um, however, um, one of the general stories that you always hear in the media is about how big pharma is only after dollars. And of course, they're going to give uh, medications that will cause people to commit suicide or harm, harm themselves and so forth. And of course, all that stuff generally is true. You know, a uh, pharmaceutical industry is an industry. It's a business. It works in a capitalist society. And so uh, they are going to be after profits. Uh, but they are also um, operating to generate medical treatments, uh, successful medical treatments. And um, when medications come out for treatment uh, for depression or anxiety, um, those drugs will go through a whole series of testing uh, along with the government through the FDA to make sure that they're both safe and effective. Uh, safe meaning that, of course, that a person will not develop any kind of significant problem from it. Um, and of course, there may be some problem, but you have to judge uh, the amount of problems from the side effects of the drug in relation to the uh, problem of the psychiatric disorder itself. And effective means that it actually significantly does treat things. So if you say that uh, Prozac treats depression or anxiety, uh, you have to actually show in a well-controlled study that uh, depression and, and anxiety are reduced by taking Prozac. Will there be problems? Yes. Will some people be very sensitive and potentially uh, commit suicide or um, have other types of psychiatric problems secondary to the treatment of the, uh, with Prozac? Absolutely. Um, that's going to be true uh, for any drug. It's not specific to Prozac, but it's just the process by, the, uh, by how things operate um, in the system. It's the best you can actually do. You generate a new molecule in a, in a laboratory. Uh, you have to treat, it, uh, treat animals with it to see whether or not it kills them. Uh, if it has functional properties that indicate it might be useful in terms of a psychiatric disorder, it gets moved on to a small number of healthy volunteers that don't have the psychiatric problem to see whether or not they can uh, tolerate the drug. And then you increase the doses, you, then you move it over to the people that are sick, and you continue on um, checking. But know that unlike in the 1930s with frontal lobotomies where it looked like it worked so you didn't follow up, today follow-up on drugs takes place over the course of decades. In fact, I would say in general, there really is no stopping any evaluation of any psychiatric treatment at all, uh, whether it's a drug treatment, a surgical treatment, or even a talk therapy. The data for the treatment process is collected and people can go in and evaluate the information pull it together into uh, large-scale analyses to evaluate how well it works. And that's a kind of a process that takes place all the time now. So um, the evaluation of a drug treatment is a consistent mainstay of the treatment for psychiatric disorders. Yes, it's true, pharmaceutical industries want to get profits, but don't let that be the only story that you allow yourself to hear. That's basically the only story that you're going to hear on television, right? It's going to be the really negative story about uh, profit making, profiteering. Uh, but uh, there is a consistent scientifically derived process uh, that generates new medications and they are evaluated um, for the benefit of everyone. Finally, the treatments that you wind up seeing are going to be uh, different than uh, they were back in the early uh, 20th century. Back in the early 20th century, you went often as a Freudian psychologist, uh, you lay down on the couch, you talked about your dreams, you got hypnotized. There's a lot of talking that would uh, not take place today. Today, therapy is very specific to why you're there in therapy. You are retraining your thoughts, emotions, and behavior in a specific way. 
When you come into therapy, you don't talk about irrelevant things. You deal with the problem. Why are you there? Well, okay, you're there for an anxiety problem or you're there for depression. Then you're going to deal with anxiety or depression specifically. You're not going to talk about your relationship with your mother if that, if that has nothing to do with your anxiety or your depression. You're not going to talk about your dreams because they are probably unlike, you know, uh, unrelated to anything uh, that you're having as a psychiatric problem today. So you're going to be very specific to deal with the problems and the, the ways in which you're going to retrain your thoughts is largely going to be based through behavioral therapy. Now it will come under very different names, but all therapy at its heart of it uh, is going to have some process in which uh, associations between punishments and rewards are going to be established. You're going to replace problems of behavior that are problematic and replace them with more positive patterns of behavior. And all of that actually comes out of the field of conditioning. You're going to do the same thing with your uh, emotional states um, and your overt patterns of behavior. So there's a very strong behavioral approach, even when it's not always referred to as behavior therapy, whatever type of therapy gets done today as part of the basic gold standard will apply the basics of conditioning uh, to that therapy simply because you know uh, for a fact that conditioning principles are always operative, they can be used to modify your behavior, and it would be inappropriate to not use behavior therapy in a therapeutic process today because it's an available treatment option. All of this leads to a reiteration of something we've talked about way back in chapter two and in chapter three, which is the use of the biopsychosocial model. Um, you may remember from the earlier chapters, the biopsychosocial model was created by a medical doctor in the early 70s, originally as a way to understand the treatment processes for individuals who were uh, identified as alcoholic. Um, and part of that evaluation started to show that there were um, biological, psychological, and social causes that led to the development of alcoholism, as well as the likelihood for relapse. And uh, nothing has changed here. This is essentially the third time during the semester where we're bringing up the biopsychosocial model. Uh, but because we are in the psychological disorders chapter, um, it's useful to point out again the three main causes of how psychological disorders occur and the uh, reasons why a person might relapse. The biological causes, the psychological causes, uh, which are essentially related to a person's individual personal history, as well as the social context in which things occur, the culture in which the problem exists, always modifies the, uh, uh, the processes involved. And remember, as I've, I've mentioned before, this biopsychosocial approach is really the same thing as the whole story of nature and nurture. It's just that the nurture component of it, the environment component, has been broken into two pieces. Individual personal history called psychological causes and social causes, which are related to context. So it's biological causes versus the psychological social causes. That's the biological versus environmental, or in the terms of personality theory from the last chapter, trait theory versus the social learning theory. Now let's consider this question. The use of the biopsychosocial model reinforces our belief that C, all psychology is both biology and environment. That's exactly how the whole process operates. And uh, that should be, at this point, a relatively clear point to you, uh, given all the things that we've talked about over the course of the semester so far.